What is up, Pitt fans? Thank you so much for tuning back into Inside the Panthers on YouTube. My name is Stephen Thompson, coming at you with another Inside Pitt practice report from the South Side, following Pat Narduzzi's final press conference of the week before his team kicks off the season opener against Wofford on se- September 2nd. We spent a lot of time talking to head coach Pat Narduzzi about the Terriers today, so that's where we'll start. Wofford, what is it? Wofford's a small private college in Spartansburg. South Carolina that plays in the football champion su- championship subdivision, the lower half of Division One football. Pitt plays in the FBS football bowl subdivision. That's where most of the teams that you know play, as well. The Terriers are going through a head coaching transition from one pick, uh, one former Pitt coordinator to another. Josh Conklin, who used to be uh, one of Pat Narduzzi's defensive coordinators, uh, resigned after an 0-5 start in 2022, and then uh, a former Pat Narduzzi offensive coordinator, Sean Watson came in to replace him. Uh, he led them to a 3-3 three and three record in the aftermath of Conklin's re- resignation. And on offense is where you could see some of the biggest improvements. Uh, you know, the Terriers went from 7.6 points per game over the first half of the season to 30.6 in the second when Watson took over. Appreciate Jim Hammett from Panther Lair. He's the one who compiled these stats, uh, borrowing them from him. Uh, the Terriers also have a pair of, uh, you know, Southern Conference all freshmen members from 2022 coming back and wide receiver Dylan Dejeet, hope I pronounced his name right, and uh, Kyle Parsons, a running back. Uh, but the biggest question is who's going to run the show for the Terriers this year? Uh, they've got two quarterbacks that we talked a little bit about with Pat Narduzzi. One only has about 21 snaps on film, and 19 of them are from uh, spring season in 2021. You know, the, the, most of the country played in the fall of 2020, albeit under some weird circumstances, but another group waited until the spring. Uh, you know, a lot of those FCS schools did. So that's where, you know, at least one of their quarterbacks got a lot of work and the other is a true freshman. So there's a lot of unknowns uh, in this, in this Wofford, uh, in this Wofford offense, one that did take some steps forward, but still is a little bit of a question mark. Uh, they're a decent passing offense, uh, and they've also got a pretty good offensive line, uh, one with some experience, which always correlates to success. And the Panthers should be tested, at least along the defensive line and in the front seven, by a Wofford offense that has a lot of returners up front, and, and that should maybe pave the way for some for a guy like Parsons to to make some room to run. Um, they they were pretty, like I said, they were pretty successful throwing the ball last year, but with some new signal callers and it's tough to say what they will exactly look like, especially as they transition away from kind of an option style attack and into a more pro style, uh, pro style offense under Sean Watson. So the defense is somewhat of a different story. Uh, They return a lot of starters, but it's starters from a defense that was truly, truly abysmal, even by FCS standards, especially by FCS standards last year. uh, The Terriers were 99th in total defense, 86th in scoring, 90th in passing, and 99th in rushing. Those are their national ranks in those categories. So, yeah, they bring back their top four tacklers from a year ago, but, you know, that's kind of the double-edged sword with returning experience you expect guys to improve but improving from such a low place is uh is certainly going to be a task and uh especially when they open the season against a team that is decidedly more talented there's a uh, and that's not even a a a judgment that is just a fact the uh, you know teams in the fbs like Pitt get simply more scholarships to play around with in the fcs that's why there is a separation between these two these two divisions of excuse me, these two halves of division one. So I, I kind of expect it to be, to be a rough game for the tears. And that's, that would have been even before uh, Michael Mason, who uh, recorded 26, 20 sacks, excuse me, over 36 games as a terrier. He transferred, he's at coastal Carolina this year. So the terriers lose one of their biggest weapons on defense as well. Uh, I, I think that's going to make for a long day for them. Um, Pitt, you know, unsurprisingly is going to be able to do whatever they want in this game, or at least you would hope they would, they should be able to, whether it's running the ball or throwing it deep, like we talked about in our last video. But I think this will be a good time to play with some live bullets. Um, You know, like Pat Narduzzi and a lot of his staff like to say, like those guys are on scholarship too. Um, Even if they have fewer scholarships, there are still division one football players across from you. There will be some resistance um, and it'll be different from playing against your own teammates in, in scrimmages who, know what's coming and know what to expect and know you personally and intimately, excuse me, as a player. So, you know, it's really all about whether Wofford believes the hype about Pitt's downfield passing game and tries to pull back and stop that, or 
like like Rhode Island did last year. That's what Pat Narduzzi told us. They they ran the ball a lot with Israel Vanikando last year. He ran 19 times uh, for, I want to say, 170-something yards and, and three touchdowns. And that was just a response to what Wofford was giving you. I'm pretty sure, you know, if Pitt – had a little more optimism in their in their passing offense. They they would have felt fine taking those chances there, but they're responding to what a defense is giving them. Uh, and I think that's what you know Narduzzi means when you know he says that that they're really they're gonna take what the defense gives them. It's not necessarily about oh this is the best way for us to win the game. I think they're pretty confident that they could win throwing the ball or running the ball. But you know they want to create it as game like as possible and as you know regular season game like as possible because they're not going to play FCS opponents the rest of the way they're going to introduce you know Cincinnati West Virginia North Carolina in the next three weeks following this game after and and while the Panthers are focused on this game they are looking ahead a little bit thinking about what this game will set them up for over the rest of the season so it's a good time for them to like I said play with live bullets make some adjustments on the fly read a real defense read a live defense that that doesn't know what's coming and, and that you don't know what's coming from the defense. Uh, you, like I said, not a super strong defense, but it, it is a live one, a real one. And it's one that the Panthers will have to take seriously in this game. So, you know, there were also some notes from the pit side of things uh, that we covered with, with Pat Narduzzi today during his final press briefing of the week. Uh, he left the running back room a little wide open. And I thought in kind of an odd way, uh, I, I don't think anyone who follows this team closely, and even if you don't follow this team closely, you know that Rodney Hammond is the guy, or at least he came into training camp as the guy. He was Israel Vandekanda's backup last year. Even in the backyard brawl, he took the vast majority of touches in that game, but Narduzzi left the the idea of a competition in the running back room wide open. Uh, he said he's waiting for a guy to step up, waiting for someone to really take the starting job by the horns uh, like a band of Canada did when Rodney actually went down with an injury in that West Virginia game, if you'll remember, and was out for several weeks afterwards. So, you know, between those four guys that are listed on the depth chart, that's him and Sebo Flemister, Daniel Carter, and Derek Davis. Uh, apparently they're all still fighting for carries and, and that, you know, depth chart is not set in stone at all, which I thought was interesting. And I think it, it tells you a little bit about how they're going to approach this game on Saturday. I think we'll see all of them, you know, all those four running backs that I mentioned, and even maybe Marshawn Lloyd, a freshman, take some, as Mike Tomlin would put it, varsity snaps, you know, meaningful snaps, not just garbage time, um, but snaps where the Panthers are still actively keeping their foot on the gas and, and working to score points. So, I think you'll see some diversity out of the backfield. I think they feel comfortable with all those guys, but it's about who can separate themselves, who can be excellent in a room full of, of good or decent. Uh, and so that's one thing to watch out for on Saturday. I also think that you need to watch out for Kenny Johnson. Um, Pat Narduzzi made it pretty clear today that as far as backups go, and, and Johnson has a second team role right now, but it's him and everyone else. Uh, Johnson has been the most impressive of those four freshman receivers that we've talked about. Uh, those four true freshman receivers that we talked about all summer. And then also, you know, even among uh, guys like uh, uh, Jake McConaughey and, uh, and Chad and Waco, um, some returners, some older veteran guys, Johnson standing out. And it seems like he's that fourth receiver. You know, he was beat out by Dejon Reynolds for that wide receiver three spot. But I, I, to be honest with you, I think that has more to do with experience than, than raw talent or, or ability. I think they are waiting for, Johnson to kind of catch up and learn the playbook. Same with the rest of his his freshman teammates as well. Even even those guys like Lamar Seymour and Israel Polk, guys who came in during the spring, have some learning to do. And it speaks to how impressive Johnson has been. Uh, Narduzzi raved about his maturity and said that off the field he's doing everything right. Um, and I think that includes learning the playbook, getting his nose in the film room, and, and learning just where he's supposed to be. It's really one of the biggest hurdles for a true freshman on any side of the ball at any position to account for. And, and by all accounts, Johnson's done a good job of that, but there's still a learning curve and there's still a way to, to go. So I think they're going to give him a bunch of snaps on Saturday, but ease him into it a little bit, get his feet wet and see how he does when, like I said, the bullets are live and when, you know, they can't just blow the whistle and stop a rep and bring him back. If he, if he doesn't remember a play or where he's supposed to line up or if he screws something up, no, if he screws something up, then, you know, he's, 
going to feel it, you know, and the team is going to feel it and they're feeling out whether or not they can trust Johnson to, to be a full-time contributor, be a full-time player, maybe even a starter. So keep an eye on number three or uh, number three or number two. I believe he's number three. No, no Randall, excuse me getting my numbers mixed up after they changed them at the end of training camp. Johnson is number two. So keep an eye on number two in blue tomorrow on offense, not just to see what he does, but to see, you know, the place where he's not catching the ball, you know, how's he lining up? How's he blocking? You know, how is he responding to the checks that Phil Dracovic or Christian Veyer want to make? It's, it's really a test of how comfortable the Panthers can be with him in the offense. Uh, just as much as how comfortable is he playing at the division one level after moving all the way up from, from high school in the middle of the summer. And with that, I'm headed out of here to get ready to get, keep getting ready for Saturday and our first game of the season kickoff of the 2023 season. Thank you so much for tuning into another inside pit practice report. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to us on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash at inside the Panthers and find all of our reporting right from pit practices and games at inside the Panthers.com. I'll be back on Saturday to bring you some post game thoughts after the Panthers take on Wofford. Uh, I'll, be at Axtra Stadium covering that game for you. So make sure to check out what we have for you from there. But until next time, thanks for tuning into another Inside Pit Practice Report.